Good morning, and uh, we've got Jim Carter right here this morning. Good morning, Jim. Thanks for coming. Good morning, Bill. We're here at the uh, American Legion, uh, Post 72 in Soviet East New York, and it is uh, Sunday, February 5th, 2006. And uh, presently, we also have uh, Alan Grzynski, who's our technical man who's handling the camera today. Um, so, uh, thanks for coming, like I said, Jim. And uh, can you tell us, were you drafted or did you enlist? Well, I enlisted under the threat of being drafted. Dropped out of college and it gave me about a month to enlist. I was going to. And you did uh, enlist in the Air Force? Yes. And why did you pick the Air Force? Well, I, I was kind of torn between the Air Force and the Navy, but I mainly wanted a good school and I wanted to get electronic school. Mm -hmm. So I just chose the Air Force. Kind of, Where were you kind of unusual because I'm afraid of heights, but I joined the Air Force. <laughs> Makes perfect sense to me. Where, where were you living at the time? In Schenectady, my parents. Mm -hmm. And you record your first days of service and how it started out? Uh, we, we were flown down to uh, Lackland Air Force Base, Texas. That's where the basic was. I just remember it was misery, it was cold, it was winter. I didn't realize Texas could be that cold. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what was it like when you got there then, in boot camp? Well, I think anybody who's been in boot camp would understand what it was like. <laughs> just, it was a culture shock. I was in physically good shape, thank God. Some of the people weren't, but I was in pretty good shape. So I used to run cross country and track in high school. I hadn't been that long in high school. So I, uh, I, I didn't uh, have a hard time with the physical end of it, but I, the mental conditioning I did get. When they run you through the uh, travails there and put you in there and, and give you the tear gas treatment and all that kind of stuff, I certainly didn't like any of that. Uh, you were telling me about that. How did the tear gas thing work? Did they, did they yeah, you just had, had to go in this building and uh, they uh, filled it with tear gas and they made you take off your mask and everything. Of course, there was always one guy who was slow taking it off. You, know, you had to sit there until everybody had their mask off for so long a period of time. And I don't remember the real details except I just remember it burnt the skin. I, I always knew it was going to burn my lungs and eyes, but I didn't realize how it burnt the skin. Do you remember your instructors? No. So you got through boot camp okay then, right? Yeah. And where did you go after that? Uh, I was sent to uh, Biloxi, Mississippi. We actually went by bus from Texas to Mississippi. Uh, Keesler Air Force Base, where we, I was spent almost a year in electronic school. Uh, early morning radar. It was brand new at the time, and it was taught by engineers from the firm that designed it. But, Your service was uh, at the, during the Cold War period and at the very beginning of Vietnam, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And then where did, where did you go be, uh, after you went to uh, Keesler? And I, there were only two bases that really had our planes that I was uh, trained to, to work on. And that was uh, McClellan in California or, or, or uh, Oleson in uh, Cape Cod. And uh, at the time, my father was diagnosed with lung cancer and I wanted to be as close to home as I could be. So I asked for Cape Cod. And the airplane you were flying was? Uh, the Constellation, the EC-121, as they were called. They, were, they had a big radar on the belly, and a big, you know, vertical radar, on, I find the radar on, on top of it. Mm -hmm. They were the original AWACS airplane, right? Right. right. They, they were, the ones that we had were, they were the, the latest and greatest. They were retrofitted with the, they were tied in by computer to, uh, to Stewart Air Force Base. You know, earlier versions of that plane had uh, a whole bunch of radar consoles, and the guys would verbally call them the tracks with microphones. But it was all uh, automated by the time I did it. What was your actual assignment? You... I actually uh, was a repairman. I, I would power the radar up, get it all aligned, keep it running while we were up. It was not just the search. We had a central gyro reference system that you know, stabilized the radar in relation to the plane. It was the first radar that could uh, paint moving target indicators. In other words, it'd take the plane's attitude, azimuth, speed, and everything, and it would cancel out everything that wasn't moving in relation to us. So the sea clutter disappeared, and then we could follow tracks very, you know, very expertly. So it was a drastic movement. 
So this was an early warning system because at the time it was still well within the realm of possibility that Soviets would try to attack us. Uh, yeah, the idea was if the Soviets were sending bombers, they would be sending us right out just at sea level, you know, maybe 100 feet up. And we went out beyond the Navy picket ships on, the, on both coasts, actually, and beamed down over the curvature of the Earth in that way. We flew about uh, 15,000 feet, but we went out beyond and we beamed down. I don't know exactly. I think we gave about 15 minutes extra warning or something. Coming in, it would be coming in at sea level, and that was our purpose. We had like five stations from uh, up near Thule, Greenland, to uh, on down south to cover the east coast. So you were on flight status during this time, and you were awarded flight flight crew wings. Totally. And uh, I take it you're. I think you were, you also mentioned you got the uh, Air Force uh, Good Conduct Medal during the time you were in. And uh, yeah, they didn't know about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> it looked good on paper. <laughs> now, you uh, had mentioned uh, that uh, this, how long were you on this flight status? Uh, out of, uh, well, just, just about the whole time I, mm -hmm. I was in there. You could, you could work in the radar shop, and some people did. They didn't all fly. Mm -hmm. But uh, I quickly, I, there was, I think it was $55 extra a month on our flight status, and a lot more time off. Cape Cod in the summertime with the beaches and that it was nice to have that money and time off. So. Mm -hmm. and so I overcame my fear of heights and became airborne. <laughs> uh, how'd you stay in touch with your family? Well, actually, I, I could drive home on every other weekend pretty much. It was just a, a money thing. It was like having a, a job. You know, you would fly and then you always got crew rest and sometimes an off day and sometimes fly, crew rest, off, off. So. It, a lot of time off. The flights typically were 12 to 15 hours, but occasionally you could, a lot of equipment on there and a lot of old equipment would fail, and you know, you'd have to come back after only a couple hours and count it as a full flight. So, mm -hmm. right. yeah, how was the food and so forth? Well, it was, it was all adequate. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the best part of it was that the in flight kitchen, if you were on flying status, when you went in, you could go to the in flight kitchen and get whatever you wanted breakfast, lunch, dinner, steak. You know, mm -hmm. That was nice. But nonetheless, you, did you feel any pressure or stress during these times? Well, being afraid of heights, flying was not exactly my <laughs> bailiwick, but I mean, I did it. And, yeah. mm -hmm. Was there anything you didn't think of for good luck, that type of thing? Not that I remember. How did people entertain themselves? Well, it was Cape Cod in the summertime, and uh, as I remember, uh, a lot of college girls for waitresses, you know, and all. Resort area, you know, so it was great. You mentioned me, the, the flight wings are pretty impressive, too. Yeah, the flight wings were almost as good as you know passing out the fraternity pins. It was quite effective. Uh, <laughs> I would go any further than that. Where else did you travel uh, besides uh, Cape Cod? Uh, one winter, I went to uh, Kinley Air Force Base in Bermuda and, uh, because of Cape Cod is famous for its fog. We would get socked in a lot, and you know, that was an alternative landing site for the planes, especially the ones on the southern legs. And I, I was down there on the ground to turning around the planes that did have to land there. So I spent one whole winter there. Yeah, you mentioned that you saw a, uh, a, a aircraft that crashed during that time. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, it was a, uh, a weather plane, a, a converted uh, tanker or something, converted to a weather plane. And it, and it uh, came in the one uh, runway in Kinley, was right alongside the ocean. This had a rock jetty and then it dropped down in the water. It wasn't any kind of dramatic thing. When the plane came in, it, uh, it was a four-engine prop here, and we reversed the props. And the starboard props reversed, and the uh, port props didn't, and it just took a 91 right over the edge. Nobody was killed or anything, but the plane was just demolished. Uh, you had mentioned uh, one of the pranks that they um, played on each other there having to do with the, the high-output radar. Can you tell us about that? Uh, part of our maintenance was uh, the, the waveguide on our, our radar was a 10 million watt radar and, you know, for a short pulse period. But part of the maintenance was uh, there were air dryers. and uh, It was almost like the, the waveguide was circular and it was about three or four inches in diameter. It was, it was like a huge coax with a solid copper core. And if you, one of the sergeants disconnected it and uh, he wanted to see what would happen if you fired up the radar without the waveguide on it. We thought he was kidding. 
we did bypass a few safety circuits, and it came up at about, I, I would say, 30% power, so that would probably be a 3 million watt. Well, sat right behind there, there was a guy working on the radios, and his back was turned, and he didn't know what was going on. And I realized the sergeant was going to pulse the radar without the, you know, we had dummy loads and every reason in the world to be safe. And he just decided to do it. I started to run. I was going to try and get off the back of the plane, but he hit the button before I could. It sounded like two shotguns going off, you know, at the same time. And the hole inside of the plane he lit up. Eerie blue color, you know, with the radiation or whatever came out of it. And scared the lid, even though I knew it was coming. I mean, the radar, radio operator, if it didn't know it was coming, he just, he flew off that plane. All you could see was eyeballs. So it was just terrorized. <laughs> you know, what happened? You know, people did stupid things and that came under the category. I don't know how much radiation we were exposed to, but it really an honor. We used to wear the little uh, neon bulbs so we could tell if we were up at the upper radar and somebody turned on the high finder radar, we could, it would light up, we'd know we were in the presence of radiation. Other than that, I don't remember really too many people did things all the time. They would chase people around. The oil, there was always oil in that fiberglass radar on the bottom, and they would get somebody in there, they'd turn the antenna on and chase them around the radar with it so they could dive out the little access hole we had there. That sort of stuff. You had mentioned good clean fun. Good clean fun. You had mentioned to me that uh, you had a, a flight that uh, nearly ended in tragedy. Would you tell us about that? Yeah, I'll never forget that. We were, uh, it was the middle of the night, and I happened to be on duty, so I was sitting in front of the console, just you know, watching things, basically. Well, where were you Tweeting. flying? You were flying yeah. over? Uh... We were over the North Atlantic, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know which station we were on. We used to fly, and they wouldn't let us move off station. Sometimes we'd be in thunderstorms, and everybody would get sick. And State. But that night it was there was no storm or anything. But uh, I was just sitting there, and all of a sudden I felt strange. It was a silence, basically. And I heard a click, and the radar all went off, and the dull yellow lights came on. We basically lost all four engines. I found out that radar planes don't glide; they get what's called a negative glide ratio, so they fall greater than a 45 degree angle. What altitude were you at when this happened? Probably around uh, 15,000 feet. We bottomed out at uh, about 3,000 feet when they got the engine stuck. What happened in between time? Sheer terror. I was on the roof of the plane and I was clawing my way. You know, we were supposed to put on our survival suits, turn our chairs around into crash position, get, you know. And I just, all the time, just knew we were going to die. You know, I, was, I was saying that to Patricia, I was about a Catholic. You know, just terror. Sheer terror, trying to do an SC and I couldn't. And uh, frankly, after they got the, the they got the engines restarted, I don't know at what altitude they restarted. I just know we bottomed out about three thousand feet. The, the G's we were pulling, I couldn't get up and get in the seat. The young and scared and strong as I was, I couldn't make it into that seat. And I just knew we were going to be in that ocean, and you know, I knew it was the same as getting comfort to get water at that speed. Somehow they got them restarted. The flight engineer was strapped in, and. Uh, Safety things, and they threw all all fuel sources on, all ignition on, and the props were still, you know, in the, in the, they were the props you could pitch, you know, and they were in position, so they were spinning, and they got the engines restarted. Not before we fell almost two miles, and uh, you don't ever forget something like that. Matter of mm -hmm. fact, I never uh, flew with the Air Force after that. But the psychiatrist interviewed us and said, you know, you're getting out in three or four months here. You don't. You'd have to use a gun to get back on one of those planes. <laughs> you told me they flew home after that from the, getting the engine started in the silence. Nobody had said anything. Yeah, it was, it was the weirdest thing. It was, uh, I think everybody was just lost in their own thoughts. The captain said, uh, you know, we're going back. And uh, they didn't know what happened, but the flight engineer knew he had just switched fuel tanks slightly before. The investigation showed that this was a Navy retrofit plane that we were on the it was taken from the Navy and retrofitted for the specs and the radar that the Air Force used. And they had miswired the gauges in the fuel tank switches. They used to run the tip tanks on the tip of the wing, which then the wing tanks and then the belly tanks. You know? We ran 115, 145 grade milk gas and those things. Pretty volatile stuff. And they kind of balanced it by going in. And when he switched, he switched into tanks. And, uh, we ran out of fuel, basically, all at once. 
converters quit and you know we had no electric we just went on battery backup that was that dull yellow glow so uh, not that you would have been able to ditch anyway but you later told me that uh, you found out that they found out that the aircraft really couldn't ditch very well anyway. yeah the navy uh, navy versions that didn't have the belly radar we used to they used to actually ditch them the navy pilots for training and they were using for gunnery practice so uh, the logic said that with our planes, the first time we skipped, we'd take the antenna and radon off, and then, and then it would just settle in like a normal kind. Of and then, a couple of years or a year after I got out, they tried to ditch a couple of them that were, were not going to make it back. And, uh, and Tom C's, one of them off Nantucket and one off Marcus Rangers, they lost everybody on board both planes. The planes just came apart and they tried to ditch them. You know, they had chase planes and they were Tom C's. And once they realized that you know, we didn't carry shoots, we had no way to get off of them. So kind of at the end of their life span anyway. They, they just grounded the whole fleet two years after I got So you mentioned that uh, shortly thereafter you left the Air Force, yeah? Yeah, I was I, I spent almost four years. They got me out a couple of weeks early for Christmas. What did you do after you left the Air Force? I went back to school for a while, went back to college. And, and then I got this great job offer at IBM. And, spent the next 30 years. And we used that electronic stream basically to further my career at IBM you know, as a field leader. Yeah. Did you um, form any friendships while you were in the service? Did you stay in touch with the people? Yeah, a couple of guys that, uh, that were real close. Uh, Mac Henslow, I still get Christmas cards and stuff. But, you know, we talked to them. And, and, and my uh, roommate, Jay, lives down south of here. But he kept contact. Now you belong to the American Legion, right? Yeah, that's how it is. Would you like to tell us how you felt uh, your military experience affected your life in general and what your attitude is toward the military and like that? You know, I think the, the single thing that stands out the most was uh, the near death experience. You know, changed my view of, of life in general, you know, how quick it can end. And, you know, just trying to live right with, you know, with life. For, for the fullest, you know, I never really thought about it until that happened. It, just, it wasn't part of my thinking process. I guess. I, you know, in general, the, the learning, the discipline, and you know, it was good for me. I really needed that. It was kind of a, I shouldn't say a wild kid, but I wasn't exactly you know, a saint in school. You know, I was one of these kids that was blessed with an intellect where I didn't have to really study, so I found other avenues to maintain myself. <laughs> I agree with that, but we'd get almost straight A's, but I was still a troublemaker for the jokes that was fine. Well, um, anything else you'd like to add, Tyler? Nothing. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, Jim. Thank you. Thank you.